fine furniture, musical instruments, functional art, beautiful decoration. These pieces, and others like them, are crafted in wood by master woodworkers who live here in Santa Cruz County and on the Central Coast. In this series, we meet some of these craftsmen and explore the paths they took to develop their talents. We will look at examples of their work. We will discover what and who inspired them. Please join us as we enter their workshops and watch them demonstrate the skills and the techniques they use in creating their signature pieces. Hello and welcome to the second programme in our series Woodworks. My name is John Hall and I'm delighted today to be visiting Mickey Singer here at his house and workshop in Felton, Santa Cruz County. Morning Mickey. Morning John. Welcome to the show and uh, thanks for inviting, inviting us along today. Thanks for coming by. We would like to start the program today by talking firstly about your work. And I know that uh, in a few minutes we're going to go and actually take a look at some pieces and ask you to talk about them and uh, describe them to us. But before we do that, how would you describe the type of woodwork that, ch that you do? Well, I, I mostly do residential and office furniture, standalone furniture, generally in contemporary in style. Um, a little bit of Asian influence, a little bit of Nouveau, Deco. I, I, I sort of pull from a lot of different schools of thought as mm -hmm. far as design goes, but it's mostly pretty contemporary. Mm -hmm. And these are all one-off pieces? Yeah. Custom designed? Right, right. Generally, probably 98% of the work I do is custom commissions directly to clients. And so each piece is designed based on their needs and, you know, their criteria that, that they're looking for. And, and I like to, to involve them in the process. So um, a lot of the pieces that I make have design elements that I might not have even thought of that, you know, the, the client said, well, what can, how about if we do that? I generally will come up with a general, you know, they'll, they'll come to me and they'll say, I need, you know, X sort of piece for this sort of room. And I'll go over and look at the house and look at their style and, and come up with a few ideas to start with um, and then give them options and, you know, sort of a smorgasbord, you know, you like a little bit of that and a little bit of that and a little bit of that mm -hmm. and we'll combine them together. And mm -hmm. so, um, a lot of what I have sort of starts with me and kind of ends with the client. So there's always a lot of gi good give and take there. Are you ever asked to reproduce something that you've already made? Uh, I have a couple of times. Um, and generally, it, it ends up not being a direct reproduction. Um, I've got a couple of pieces that have spawned. I like this piece, but I need a bigger. Or I needed a different size and dimension, and so it'll go that way. Um, or they'll like a piece that I have, like specific elements of a piece, and then we'll work those into something that works for what their project is in specific. Okay, so I've got a question as, a, as an amateur woodworker myself. Do you, do you make pieces, first of all, out of rough wood before you make the final piece, or do you go straight into the final piece and create it as you're going along? Sometimes. Um, it depends on how complicated it is, and it depends on how off the beaten path it is. If it's a if it's a piece that that someone d wouldn't normally relate to, like an end table, um, if it's an odd shape or size or scale, then I'll often make like a cardboard or plywood mock-up and take it to the client and say, "Is this really what you want?" You know, mm -hmm. because if it's something, if it's like a dining table, everybody can relate to that size and shape, and that's not that big a deal. But if it's like, I had a, a client several years ago. Um, that wanted a big bedroom unit and it was like 19 feet long and nine feet high and mm. it the scale was just massive mm -hmm. and so i you know i went out there and and took some blue painters tape and taped out the 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 image on the wall for them so they could see just how big it really was mm -hmm. and, and yeah so sometimes mock-ups are necessary and and sometimes they're not really okay so you make quite a wide variety of, of pieces are there some things that you particularly enjoy working on more than others? Yeah, not really. Um, you know, small tables give you sort of a freedom to do things that you couldn't do in large pieces. Um, end tables, console tables are sort of kind of a playground. You know, you can do all sorts of weird things that might not work in any other sort of piece if you just 
sort of plinking around. Mm -hmm. Are there types of wood that you enjoy working with more than others? There are things like Ipe that I don't like working with because they're really splintery and, and you know, the dust is really irritating. Um, but generally, I'll work with whatever needs to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so let, let's step back a bit, Mickey. How, how did you get into woodworking? Uh, well, it's just sort of by the back door. I was a marine mm. biologist for 20 years, and, you know, that was what I did all my graduate work and everything in. And as I getting towards the end of that, stint um the funding that i had was mostly from the state mm -hmm. um and they were all cut back so i was having to cut back my hours and at the same time my wife and i had bought our first house and it needed a bunch of work and so i started buying tools to do the work and and sort of got back in i had done you know wood shop in high school like everybody and and liked it and then just sort of drifted away from it and as I kind of got back into working in the house and working with wood and tools again, oh, this is kind of fun. And mm -hmm. it's like, well, gosh, now I need to figure out how to pay for these tools that I'm buying. So I started doing, you know, small commissions for friends and family and uh, kind of a typical story. And then as my time was being cut back at the lab that I was running, um, I started picking up more furniture work. And eventually when the state took our funding away, I could, mm -hmm. at that point, I could either, um, you know, keep driving an hour and a half each way to the lab I was working at and have to come up with a bunch of money to pay for myself and my lab assistants and the overhead of the lab and all that stuff. and Or just put that effort into getting clients for myself doing woodworking. And so I sort of made the jump. Okay. And how long ago was that? About 10 years. So what sort of training have you had in the last 10 years then? Uh, very little formal training. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I've, I've taken a few, you know, like one day seminar courses and especially when I was First, about 12, 15 years ago, I started getting into Japanese tools. And so I went up into the Oakland, Berkeley area and took a couple of one-day classes on mm -hmm. using Japanese tools and what they were about. Um, and I've taken a couple of, you know, sort of day seminars here and there from, from really good makers like Roger Heitzman and Pat Stafford, um, who are, you know, also in the Santa Cruz Woodworkers with, mm -hmm. with Matt and I. Um, uh, but mostly it's been trial and error and reading books and magazines and that kind of stuff. Wow, so you've got some pretty uh, pretty lovely pieces here by being self-taught. Thank you. <laughs> so what would you advise somebody who is uh, uh, currently at their desk, be it marine research or, or whatever, uh, wondering about what to do with the rest of their lives and thinking about, oh, perhaps, perhaps I could do something with woodwork. What would you what would you advise those people to? I'd say don't quit your day job. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough way to make a living. And, and you know, the until you have done it long enough to get to a certain echelon, business is really hot and cold. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's really not much of a way to make a living mm -hmm. unless you want to, you know, make kitchen cabinets and libraries and things like that. There's there's more of a market for it. But for for one off furniture, it's a pretty tough road to hoe. Mm -hmm. Where could people go to see examples of your work? Uh, mostly right now, the website that I have. Um, there are a few pieces that I have down in Santa Cruz mm -hmm. at the Rittenhouse with the Santa Cruz Woodworkers exhibit. So, what about the future, Mickey? Are, are there other things that you that you want to you want to learn? Are there things that you want to accomplish in the area of woodworking? Are there things that you're working on that are more future oriented than? Uh, um, I'm a relative newbie at all this, so I'm always, you know, in awe of the guys that have been doing it for a long time and have all these techniques down that I am still mm -hmm. sort of rock grappling with. Mm -hmm. um, it would just be to keep keep pushing ahead. You know, I mean, every every client that comes in the door is a different challenge, which mm -hmm. is the fun of it. Mm -hmm. You know, if I were doing the same table over and over and over and over and over again, it, it wouldn't be as fun. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, uh, it's nice when someone comes in and wants something I haven't done before. And if I have to learn something new, well, you just go learn it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, know, you, you mess up a bunch of wood doing some yeah. experiments and then you, you move forward. Is there much dialogue between woodworkers on the East Coast and West Coast or indeed in the central of the country? Uh, yeah, there, there is to some extent. I mean, it, unless you are sort of in a community where you've gone to an art school, you know, a, a design school and, and have that sort of built-in camaraderie um woodworkers are pretty isolated kind of guys you know we have to sort of sometimes make an effort to break out of our shops and go talk to other people and so mm -hmm. that was why you know santa cruz woodworkers or 
or other um, you know guilds or the furniture society. I mean, it's fun to go to the furniture society. You know, every year they have a conference, and you get people from all over the country, and it, it, that's really inspiring. And it sort of gets the juices flowing again because everybody's doing really cool work, and it's really diverse. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, it, it's good. Okay. You mentioned a couple of um, organizations there, the Furniture Society and the Santa Cruz Woodworkers. Mm -hmm. Tell us a bit about both. Uh, well, the Furniture Society is a na national, actually an international um, group that was founded, gosh, I don't know, 15 years ago, something mm -hmm. like that. Um, and its its basic premise is to promote studio furniture and, you know, help up and coming students and things like that. And um, it's a great inspiration for me. You know, like I say, there's a lot of um, a lot of the big art schools and colleges in the country and woodworking schools are all sort of tied into that and they have scholarship programs and that kind of thing. And they have a conference every year that, that jumps around the country. Mm -hmm. um, it's always fun to go to. The Santa Cruz Woodworkers is much more local. It's about a dozen of us that sort of came together as more of a marketing consortium than anything else because we realized that together we can you know, get our message out more effectively than any one of us mm -hmm. for any given dollar. And so we're just trying to promote, um, you know, local woodworking in Santa Cruz County. You said earlier you, you don't do uh, staining, you don't stain wood. How do you finish the, uh, uh, the I, projects? I generally use, uh, depending on what the client wants as far as durability and, you know, how much it will patina over time, um, I generally use either shellac in a sort of French polish type way or, or polyurethane um, and some water-based polyurethanes too. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to demonstrate for us later on in the uh, in the program? Well, um, a lot of the, the pieces or several of the pieces that I've put out lately um, have done matched curves uh, in that it's a rectilinear sort of piece but to soften it we put curves curved lines and rather than doing it in veneer um, that sort of came about where I had a client who wanted a, a DVD cabinet but she had little kids and so you know veneer was a little bit iffy mm -hmm. because it was going to take a lot of abuse so we did it out of solid wood and so um, there's a technique that I actually read about in fine woodworking a few years ago for making um, match templates so I'm going to do a, a little demonstration of that so you can get matte pieces of wood on curves. Mm. We look forward to it. So how about if we take a walk inside now and take a look at some of the pieces that you have made? Sure. Um, we can take a look at them and perhaps you can talk about each one as we uh, walk through the house. Great. I've got a, a couple of pieces here that I've been showing recently. Uh, this is a chair that was uh, originally sort of, the inspiration came about a number of years ago when I saw a Sam Maloof exhibit uh, back in DC. And just the way he sculpted his chairs and everything was, I, I thought was very cool. And not wanting to do yet another Maloof chair, that was just sort of the jumping off point for me. And I wanted something that was ergonomic like his, um, but that was a little more off the beaten path. Um, so I came up with this and I, and everybody asked me where the inspiration for it was. And I don't actually really know how it got there, but um, this is what I ended up with. Um, a lot of people, when I first made it, said it looked like either a giraffe or a gazelle, so it was called the Serengeti chair, and since I've had a, a bunch of people tell me it looks sort of like a, Japan, or a, a Chinese guitar thing, um, I don't know what they're called, but either way, um, it's, it's a lot more comfortable than it looks. It's, it's always sort of intimidating to people because um, it looks sort of uncomfortable, I guess, but uh, they're always very happy when they sit in it. Uh, there's a couple of these down at the at the written house at the exhibit that's down there with a table that went with it. Uh, the other piece here is a, a console table that I designed a few years ago, um, and it didn't really have too much of an inspiration other than I was just it was for a, originally designed for a show that I did with a group that I used to show with in San Francisco, uh, and I wanted something that was sort of graphic in in shape but still had a lot of texture to it. Um, and so I, I've used that squiggle sort of shape in, in a number of pieces, and so I wanted to try to take that into a table and see what I could do with it. Uh, and that's where it came out. It's, it, it is sort of nautical looking, because it has the sort of wave in the, the, the upright and the kind of shaped um, base. The table is made out of wangi, the base, uh, with 
um, bird's eye maple top and, and some ebony inlays in it. Uh, the chair is curly maple uh, with cocobolo accents on it, uh, and then that's leather on the seat. And how did you craft the back of that chair? It looks carved. Uh, it's actually just bandsawn and then um, hand shaped from there. the The actual shape of the uh, of the the back pieces came about that I had a bunch of people over uh, for a Super Bowl party one year and put some graph paper up on the wall and traced the curvature of everybody's backs and then sort of took an average of all that. And that's how I came up with the, the shape to it. Are there other pieces around that, um, that we can see from, from here that we can... Uh, sure, well, the coffee table, uh, I did that uh, several years ago. That was a another example of kind of a site-specific piece. I, we wanted it to be in here. Uh, and the shape was sort of dictated by the flow of the room, the, being the, the couch there and the traffic flow around it. And um, I wanted something that was light because it's a very light room, so we went with the glass top and sort of an open base, and that was just an experiment in doing those sorts of curves and shapes. The kitchen was, when we moved into this house, we realized the kitchen needed an upgrade quite badly. And so we decided that if I was going to be doing open studios and trying to use this as a portfolio piece, I would, you know, kind of go all out for the kitchen. Um, one of the main things in the kitchen is this island. Uh, it's, it's shaped to allow maximum movability around the, uh, around the kitchen and maximum access to all of the, the cabinets. Uh, it uses different materials. The main material in it is uh, straight grain drug fur. And I've tried to incorporate a bunch of curves just to make it more interesting. The back here, is a, a curved fan-shaped piece with mahogany legs. The, the fronts are uh, shop sliced uh, matched veneers, slip matched veneers as you go down, all from a single piece. Uh, the top is hard maple and then we've got this serving bar and glass that sort of accents the whole thing. The shape of the island is meant to allow accessibility to the rest of the kitchen. The, the big part in the kitchen itself was when we realized that if we pushed the refrigerator back into the garage a couple of feet, we would have room for the island in the first place. Uh, so we did that and kind of refigured the whole thing, and that way we were able to fit everything in. Uh, the shape of, this, the, of the island here is meant to match this so that nobody hits any sharp corners on the way out. Uh, the drawers here are shaped to match that curve. They're all hand dovetailed. Uh, on slides, on their, their own slides, and we've got hard um, silverware and linens and all sorts of storage there above the pot rack. Uh, storage was a main key, a key issue in this kitchen, so we sort of stuffed things wherever we could. Then we've got the, the cutting board here. This was one of those things that started out as a really good idea and ended up as being a nightmare. I thought rather than doing a regular butcher block top, why don't I make it out of hexagons instead of squares? So it took me forever to mill all these hexagons and then probably 17 glue ups to get them all together. And it's not something I really relish doing again, but if someone really wanted it, I probably could. It was just sort of a nightmare to do. Uh, we've also got doors on either side of the octagon here for storage on either side, plus a garbage pull out in the back. So we've really tried to maximize the use of the whole thing. The rest of the kitchen, as I said, is all Douglas fir with uh, redwood burl inlays. And then, you know, just to kind of brighten things up, the frosted glass and the cabinetry. So tell us what you're going to demonstrate today then, Mickey. Well, today I'm going to talk about a way to make matched curved parts. Um, I've used this several times in different pieces. And as you can see, these pieces have been cut to roughly the same shape, the same curve, but they don't really fit. And this is a really quick way to make perfectly matching parts. Generally what you would normally do in a situation like this is make a template for one side of the piece and then with a series of router bits make a template for the matching piece with equal offsets on the, on the router bits. 
And rather than going through um, several stages of temporary intermediate templates, this is a way to take one side of the, of the piece and make a, a template directly off of that for the other side. So first we put that guy where it's supposed to be. Part of the key to this is a flexible piece of ply, eighth inch plywood here. This is called bending plywood. And the way they lay these up is that it's three layers. Two of the layers go the same direction and then there's a thin layer in between so that it's very flexible in one direction. So we've got the piece here that we want to match. We have this template which has been, again, just roughly cut to it. We use that to sort of get close and pin the plywood template up against the workpiece. And then the rest of it is really super high tech. It involves little blocks of wood and hot glue. And the way we do that is the key is to get, this is the face that we're going to use as our template. And to get that really tightly up against the workpiece. So we give it a little bit of wood or glue here and press it in, getting a really tight fit between the face of the template and the workpiece. Wait that for a second. And then we just kind of walk down the piece. And what this does is these little blocks here not only force the face of the template to be against the piece that we're matching, but it also gives it some substance behind it so you can run a, a pattern making router bit along it when we shape the, the mating piece. How long does that glue take to set? Oh, a second or two. That's what's nice about hot glue. It's not very permanent, but it's really quick. And it's permanent enough when you get all of these little blocks on here that it'll hold it through uh, several series of use. You know, it'll, it'll be pretty substantial by the time we're done with it. And so, you know, I'm pushing, I'm pushing both down and against the, fee, the face because you want to make sure that your template is hugging the workpiece as tightly as possible. And you're leaving about, what, a quarter of an inch between the... Oh, yeah. That's, I mean, that sort of depends on how tight the radius of the curve is you're trying to match. Um, if, it's a, if it's a real tight bend, you're going to want to put them closer together just to make sure that the, the template that you're making is really true. But then sometimes you can space them out a little bit more. For the kind of stuff I do, usually one of these curves, the, the initial curve, is sort of freehanded, where I'll either freehand draw it or just go to the bandsaw and freehand cut it to, to a shape that I like. And so this way I can make whatever shape I need and then just produce a matching template to whatever shape I come up with. And it can be done sort of on the fly without a whole lot of worry or thought ahead of time. And so now what we can do is take this template. This is the matching piece of wood. And now I can come back and fix this template onto it, run it through the router table, and we'll get a perfect match. So a little bit of double stick tape here. And I can line the template up with my original line. And press it down, and then it's over to the router table. So now we've got the piece with the template on it, and all we have to do is run it across this pattern following bit, and that will clean up the other the work piece, and then we can match it to the first piece. separate those and then what we end up with are 
two pieces that are perfectly matched with no gaps. Great. Thank you, Mickey. Good demonstration. And that concludes our program for today. Thank you once again to Mickey Singer. We hope you enjoyed watching as much as we enjoyed visiting Mickey in his workshop and looking at the work that he does here in Felton Santa Cruz. Please join us again soon.